But welcome. Um, I'm joined today by one of my fellow directors at More Australia, Tim Sargent. Um, I'm sure you've all met uh, Tim and I somewhere along the line. If not, um, welcome, as I said, and, and thank you for joining us on, on today's webinar. Um, not surprisingly, we've been getting uh, lots of questions, feedback, commentary from our client base and our contact base uh, over the last two to three weeks since it was announced that the SA borders uh, would be reopening tomorrow on the 23rd of November. Um, you know, we'd all be pretty aware that uh, over the last 12, 18 months or so, South Australia uh, and Adelaide, we've been fairly lucky with the um, little numbers of COVID cases that we've had in the in the state over that period and, and been very fortunate that we haven't had to endure the lockdown that, um, you know, the rest of the world and, and many other uh, cities in Australia have had to had to deal with, uh, but highly likely that that will change as of tomorrow when the borders reopen and we start to have travel coming in from from interstate and and overseas. And I'm sure we will unfortunately start to see COVID cases starting to to come into the state. So, as a firm, um, as an Adelaide office, we've obviously been assessing the situation thoroughly assessing the, the COVID risks to, to our business, to our employees, and of course, our clients that might be coming into contact with our staff and, and, and the office. Um, and, and just keeping pace with the amount of material that is coming out from SA Health over the last couple of weeks is a, is a big task. And we're hoping today to at least give you a little bit of an understanding of that in our interpretation of it. You know, it is uncharted territory. It, it's new for all of us. Um, so, you know, it is going to be a learning curve and, and a bit of a, a, a waiting game to see how different offices are impacted. Um, so, you know, it's not not what we put in place as of tomorrow is, is, is going to be the be all and end all, but hopefully gives us a, a base to, to keep the businesses um, and, and our operations running. I suppose, you know, the last thing that we want to be dealing with is, uh, is a place of work being shut down because of SA, um, SA Health case um, coming in and, uh, you know, something we need to, we need to be protecting. So really, the theme of uh, the next sort of half an hour to 40 minutes um, is trying to mitigate those COVID risks as much as possible with the reopening of our borders, as I said, um, as of midnight tonight and when we all go into our offices and, and places of work tomorrow. So I'm uh, going to take you through a number of items. Um, first, I'm going to be talking about a lot of the work that we've been doing with clients over the last 18 months um, around setting up and developing a business continuity plan. So, you know, that's been something that I'm sure a lot of businesses already have in place, um, have had to deal with um, probably even before COVID, um, but very much through COVID um, and, you know, now being faced with reviewing, you know, some of those business continuity plans um, and what they might look like going forward with the changes that we deal with as of the 23rd of November. So I'll take you through just some work that we've been doing in that area, some things that might be useful to you um, and that uh, you might want to take into place in, in your own business. Um, and then Tim will take you through uh, some of the more recent government announcements and SA Health announcements and how they impact on your business and, and how uh, best you might deal with and, and manage those. Uh, so the first one, um, as I said, as far as setting up um, a business continuity plan. Um, so as part of the consulting work that we've been doing with clients through, through COVID, we've completed a, a number of um, business continuity plans or, or BCP plans, as we like to call them with our clients. Um, and the pandemic has presented an opportunity to, to really look at a lot of those risk areas of the business and, and how you might do and how you might manage those risks. And really, you know, business continuity plan um, isn't just about COVID and the risks that it might bring on, on your business. It, it, it's a broader risk analysis that you need to look at at the business of all risks that your business might be open to, um, but particularly COVID at, at the moment. Um, 
range of uncertainties regarding COVID and the risk of, of getting those in the business. Obviously, impossible to plan for all of those and, and where those risks might come from and, and how you might manage them. Um, but going through some sort of risk analysis and trying to identify, I suppose, the most time sensitive or critical business functions that you might face um, is, a, is a really good idea to, to try to be in, in advance of those risks and, and being aware of them and, and having mitigation and things in place to, to, to deal with them. And we've sort of tried to divide that into a, a number of areas that, uh, that we will sort of talk about and, and, and take you through um, in the webinar today in, in trying to mitigate those risks at, at the moment. So uh, again, I'm sure a lot of you have this in your business. If, if you don't, um, you know, a key, a key part of this um, is, you know, setting up um, uh, key leaders in your business that are, that are focused um, on the analysis of the data, understanding the information and making sure that the business is as ready as possible to, to, to deal with COVID. So, um, you know, we're not really needing to try to keep that to a, a, a small group. Um, of key leaders in the business to really coordinate the COVID process for you. In, you know, in our office, it's a committee of four people that, uh, that meet to, to review on a very regular basis. And, and over the last few weeks, you know, we've gone back to meeting once and twice a week to deal with the, the various information that we're dealing with. So really having that key leadership group in, in place, making sure that you then assign those roles and responsibilities within your business to, to action those. Um, and really, at the end of the day, it's that COVID committee that is ultimately, ultimately responsible for, for managing through this period and managing the business continuity plan. Um, so if you need any assistance in that, if you don't already have a, a COVID committee in place or you don't have the skills or you don't feel that you have the skills in place to, to introduce that, um, at More Australia, we've, we've developed a lot of templates and policies around that that might be useful for you in, in, in creating that structure to um, mitigate the risks. Um, the next thing that you really need to have a look at is, is identify, I suppose, key personnel in your business that if they were to get affected by COVID, you know, what effect would that actually have on your business and its ability to continue to trade and open its doors and, and do those sort of things. So um, really, you know, identifying those key people that are, um, that the business is really reliant on to function um, and how you might then mitigate the risks around those key people um, to make sure that the, that the business can function um, if they were to be um, out of the office, I mean, a worst case scenario, sick or in hospital and, and off for an extended period of time. So not surprisingly, when we've been working with clients and, and identifying, you know, those key risks and, and key individuals in the business, um, you know, the first step that we need to look at is where possible uh, to identify backup employees for those key function areas. Um, so making sure that there's some ability uh, to delegate some of those key tasks and there's others inside the business that uh, can take on those tasks uh, if that person was to be um, out, of, uh, out of the office. Um, and really trying to consider what you can do to, to minimise um, to, to minimise the risk around those key around those key people, um, be it as I said, you know, cross training, um, better systems and process documentation, um, separating teams. We're already hearing from you know some of our bigger, larger clients um, that you know have large workforces um, that uh, they're already starting to maybe look at um, A and B type rosters. Um, that may have been something that, that those businesses had in place um, previously in the early stages of COVID and, and have had to move around, away from more recently, um, but the, the, are now considering A and B type rosters to make sure that they don't have uh, everyone in the office at the same time and being able to segregate groups if, if one roster group uh, was to get affected and that roster group was removed from the office, um, you know, the second roster group um, can come in. Um, and obviously, you know, the working from home 
uh, type opportunities that we've all been dealing with uh, over the last 18 months, maybe an opportunity to, to review that and, and reintroduce that more formally um, if, if required, uh, just to reduce some of those key personnel risks. Um, you know, really important, as I said, with uh, with the borders reopening and, and us dealing with a whole lot of potentially new circumstances um, is to collect data um, and, and try to really get an understanding of what's happening inside the business and the and the risks that that we might be dealing with. So and one of the things that, that we've implemented and we know a number of our clients have implemented is considering sending out a, a confidential survey, um, really highlighting the point there that, that, you know, it's confidential information that you're collecting here around uh, people's personal health um, and getting an understanding uh, of the risk in your workforce around the vaccination status of your employees. As I said, uh, confidential information and, and something that really uh, only the COVID committee inside your organisation should be aware of, of what those responses are. Um, we've taken it uh, at More Australia when we've run the survey in, in, internally as it's not a, a compulsory survey, it's not a witch hunt, um, it's really just for us to have more information um, about what's happening in our workplace and our workforce and how best we protect the people um, with us and, and obviously our clients when they come in. So as I said, you might want to consider having that survey and, and we've got some good templates of that that may be useful um, if, if that's something that you're looking uh, to, to do. Um, as far as the, you know, the business continuity is, is concerned and we talked about sort of covering um, employees and, and making sure that there's others in the office that, that can do those tasks. Uh, really important that we that we have you know our IT systems uh, working at the highest order. You know, if your office was to to go into some sort of lockdown and be shut for a period of time, you know, making sure that uh, that our employees' IT systems are, are well established at home. Again, I'm sure a lot of you have done that already um, through the period, but just sitting down with your IT providers and, and making sure that those systems and networks and facilities and people's home offices are, are appropriately uh, set up. Um, having conversations with your, with your key suppliers as well and what they're, they're doing. Um, you know, that... Um, You've got key suppliers that potentially might be coming into your into your workplace. Understanding what what you know their COVID rules are and what they're doing with their people, and 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 can those key suppliers uh, still able to to come in interact in your workplace? You know, are they well prepared um, for for any lockdowns and isolations that they might have? So you know, having those conversations with. Uh, your key suppliers. So not only you know having those conversations with your key employees, but having those conversations with your key suppliers uh, uh, as well. Um, identifying who you know would be making decisions. So you know if the managing director or CEO was to be one of the people that you know was to get COVID and and was was formed in, forced into some form of isolation um, or you know, worst case uh, into, into hospital with some sort of health, health issues, um, you know, who are you going to delegate those decisions to, who's going to take over that decision-making process um, if that person was, was no longer available. Uh, and as I said, making sure or enabling employees to work remotely from home uh, in a safe and secure work environment. And, you know, if they are working from home, you know, making sure that they've got the same, you know, health and safety uh, standards that they would have working in the in the office uh, as well. A, a number of clients, you know, as we've gone through and, and identified the risks that might be applicable to the business, um, and I suppose the the you know the, the the biggest risk and the worst case scenario here is you know a, a COVID case occurs inside your business and your business is actually shut for a period of time, uh, and that could be an extended period of time depending you know what the case situation looks like. So, with a number of clients, you know we've already started to look at some financial modelling around that and and what that potentially might look like if a bit place of business was to be shut for seven days or 14 days or something like that, what effect that have. 
um, and in that financial modelling, um, you know, building in increased um, health and safety um, uh, spend, you know, it might be, you know, sort of bringing in daily testing inside the business to, to mitigate risk. Okay, so, you know, what is that spend on increased um, health and safety? What is the increased spend or the increased cost of the business of going with an A and B type roster versus, you know, the business being fully shut for seven or 14 days. So, you know, doing some modelling around that so that you've got some information to, to be able to, some financial information to be able to assist you to, to make the right um, scenario, um, to make the right analysis and, and, and make the right decision. And, and obviously that financial data can be very helpful in, in mitigating risk and developing strategies to develop, um, to mitigate risk. Um, and yeah, just general strategies around cash flow as well. And if the business was to, to close, what effect would that have on cash flow? How much cash flow would I need to cover for a period of time while the business is closed? Um, you know, potentially having those discussions with your bank manager to be well prepared for that. You know, generally bank managers and bankers uh, like to have information in advance and, and showing that you've done that work up front and you know what effect that might have on your business um, if that was to happen rather than um, you know having that call at a, at a point of desperation. Uh, so as I said, we've already done a lot of work in that area with our clients. So if you need some assistance on that, please reach out to us and, and let us know. Um, as we said, we already sort of talked about, you know, understanding um, not only what's happening in your own business and what's happening with your own employees and, and, and managing that risk, but, but also, you know, having a key understanding of, of what's happening with your external stakeholders. Uh, the big one that we've seen, and I think that really becomes important again is the management of your raw materials, um, how you get your stock, how you get your stock in, who you get your stock in from. Um, and, you know, being able to understand that if a major supplier's business was to be shut down because of COVID cases, how would that affect your business if you, if you didn't have an ability to access stock, uh, they couldn't supply you, uh, freight lines went down, those sort of things. So, you know, really understanding what that might mean from a raw material point of view. Again, we've worked with a lot of clients over the last 18 months, and that's, you know, meant increased stock holdings. Uh, you know, to be able to manage through it. I, th I think, you know, with the 23rd of November border opening again, you know, that really comes back on the radar as saying, okay, you know, do I need to hold additional stock to be able to manage through this process if a, if a key supplier was unable to, to, to supply me? Um, as we've already talked about, making sure that you've spoken to your IT provider, you know, what precautions they've got in place uh, to, uh, to manage your sort of, your manage your networks. Um, and, and how they would deal with that if their business was being affected, um, you know, right down to your machinery supplies. Uh, you know, if a machine was to go down and you had to have a, a maintenance person come in or a repair person come in to maintain a piece of machinery, uh, you know, is, is that machinery supplier or maintenance provider uh, got their own structures and systems in place to be able to assist you and manage through that process. So really, as I said, trying to analyse as many of those risks as you can inside your business, analysing them up front, be it financial, operational, HR, um, and, and trying to mitigate those risks as much as possible by having, you know, a really good plan in place. Uh, and having that sort of key COVID group or committee uh, meeting regulator to, to understand those risks, the mitigation that you're putting in place to, uh, to have, so that your business has a minimal effect as possible. And at the end of the day, you know, what we're seeing and, and, and saying to people is, you know, communication is the key. Most things in business, Communication is, is is what we talk about, isn't it? And 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 I think through this period, we we really can't be burying our uh, our head in the sand. Um, you know, there needs to be uh, constant communication with all the various stakeholders in the business uh, to be able to, to to manage this situation and, and mitigate the risk um, as we sort of move through, forward from the twenty third of November. Um, especially, you know, in the lead up to Christmas with a lot more travelling happening and a lot of people, a lot more people moving around the, the country. Um, and I think clear communication with your team members, with your staff members, 
Uh, it really provides confidence to your people. It shows your people that you've got a clear understanding of, of the risk of the business. Um, you've taken a considered a, a approach um, and that the employees are, are working in a, in a safe environment um, and they know coming to work all, all day that the leaders in the business um, are putting forward into it and, and making sure that the, the, the workplace that they're coming to is as, as safe as possible. Um, as I said, provides real confidence and, and, and clear structure. Um, you know, if you were to get a, and, and Tim will start, we'll talk about some of the, the, the sort of more rules coming out of out of SA Health. Um, but obviously, if you were to have a case in the, in the office, um, you need to think about what your communication would look like there. Um, are you going to have to quarantine, you know, a certain work section of your workplace? Is it broader than that? Is it smaller than that? You know, start to think about what does that communication look like? You know, unfortunately, I, you know, we, we probably are going to see all of us as employers starting to have some cases in the office. We need to understand, you know, what does that communication look like when we, when we, roll, uh, when we roll that out to, uh, to our team members? How are you going to communicate that status, um, not only to your employees, but to your customers' employees? So again, we have a COVID case at, at More Australia. We have some internal communications that, uh, that we have to issue to our team members. We've obviously got external communications that we, that we need to forward out to our clients, customers and, and suppliers as, as well. So, you know, starting to think about what those communications look like, potentially having some templates in place. Again, we've done a lot of that work internally already uh, and, and helped a lot of our clients with having some templated communications ready to, to be able to roll those out very quickly rather than running around, you know, in a, in a stressful um, environment when you've actually got a case, you've got those communications uh, ready to go. And then similarly, the communications that you would issue um, when those COVID cases or COVID cases have, have passed uh, and you're returning to, you know, returning to normal operations. So, you know, really sort of trying to think in advance about what those communications are and having those ready to go so that they can be issued uh, in a very timely manner and, and, and as planned a matter, uh, as planned a way as, as possible. Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, it is a, a community um, a, approach. You know, we've seen that in the message that we've been getting from from government, um, from from the various health uh, authorities. Um, you know, it, it's not just a, a standalone approach. We, as a communities and as, as business leaders, you know, need to need to work together, um, and we need to share information um, as much as possible. Uh, so, you know, again webinars like this and ability to be able to, to share information and, and learn from each other is really, really important because, you know, it's new for everyone. Uh, not many of us, if any of us have had to be, go through anything like this before. Um, and the more that we can share information and, and techniques and how we're dealing with it, um, you know, we're only going to, to better assist and, and, and better prepare ourselves and our businesses to, uh, to minimise the risk that, that we might be um, having, to, having to deal with. Um, and the last one before I uh, before I hand over uh, to, to to Tim um, is you know there might be some need for some training with um, with with team members in you know in how to how to manage these you know sort of various circumstances so you know making sure that that employees clearly understand your policies do policies need HR policies need to be updated. Um, you know, and and you know, making sure that that employees are, are aware of those policies, any changes that they might be there. Tim will talk about uh, uh, you know travel and, and and potentially policy changes that you need to make to your to your travel policies. So yeah, making sure that that employees uh, have have reviewed your policies if they've been updated, that they understand what those updates might look like um, and effectively the, that they're signing off on what their roles and responsibilities are under the various HR policies of the, of, of the business. Potentially, you might want to conduct exercises or case studies um, of, of what that might look like around, you know, site closures, quarantines, health emergencies, 
Uh, and I think a big one is, is public transport as well. And, you know, what does that mean for your employees that are on public transport and, you know, sort of, you know, communicating with, with, with them. Um, I know at various times we've allowed employees to start earlier and start later so that they're not on public transport at, at you know, key tra um, travel times to be able to sort of spread the social distancing and, and, and those sort of things. Um, and really just trying to make sure that, you know, all that information is in one central database. So, it's, you know, easily accessible um, and that employees know where to access that information. If they've got any questions, you know, they know where to where to go to review those policies and, and get the answers, as well as speaking to, you know, the leaders and the HR people in your business, but, you know, having a clear understanding of where those policies are and, and where they're available. Um, and the other dot point, which we haven't got there, but I know we have it at More Australia, um, is we have an employee employee assistance program as well. Um, you know, there's obviously uh, still a lot of uncertainty out there. Um, a lot of people are, you know, very concerned with with COVID and vaccination and and those sort of things as well. Um, it's a very stressful environment, uh, or it can be. Um, so, you know, having that sort of employee assistance program where employees can reach out to um, educated providers in that area external to your firm that, uh, that could be useful um, in, uh, in providing them that assistance as well. So if you don't have those sort of programs, again, reach out to us and we can introduce you to, you know, organisations that, uh, that will do that. So. As I said, just trying to give you there a, a snapshot of, you know, what, what, what we're putting in place, what we've done with a lot of clients that we work with um, around those business con continuity plans. And as I said, sort of mitigating the risk as much as possible, um, making sure that your workplace is as safe as possible for your employees and your customers and, and really sort of stopping the business from having to, to move to some sort of formal lockdown uh, per you know, some of the tables that Tim will now talk to us um, is, that have been issued by SA Health. So over to you, Tim. Oh, thanks, Grant, and good morning, everyone. I'll just start off with um, looking at how do we safeguard our employees? And I, and I suppose the first thing to cover off on is, is it very important to implement a COVID-19 response policy? And the way we see this is about education. And in some cases, re-education of, and it's not the responsibility just the employee, the employees to know this information, but it's very important that the employees also know um, what's required to, to minimise the risk of COVID coming into the workplace. And some of the points that we cover off on here is understanding the definition of a, of a close contact and, and the isolation requirements. We see mandatory face masks, particularly in public areas, as being very important. And as we go through the, uh, the SA Health advice, it, it appears to us that face masks is probably the number one protection mechanism that's out there at the moment. We also see um, assessing temperature checking, um, if it's appropriate for your business, particularly a lot of food manufacturers, um, as you enter the workforce are requiring temperature checks. It's probably an also a, a positive outcome uh, to have minimised COVID. Continuing to reinforce then hygiene, um, social distancing, and also as Grant has mentioned a couple of times, already um, if employees are looking at going into state for holidays um, accommodation it's important to get the employees to advise you where they're, where they're going and also to get a negative COVID test before re-entering the office we also have seen the government have, have released the information on on a free infection control training course. Now it is tailored towards hospitals and the aged care facilities, but it's worthwhile having a look at. And we're gonna send the link to you after this uh, seminar has been finished, but for you all to go and have a look and see how that could apply to your workforce. SA Health have implemented a table, uh, a couple of tables, one is about assessing the risk for COVID exposures. And it's an interesting table 
uh, very complicated, but I, was, I said breaking down into two main areas, whether the contact is vaccinated or whether it's unvaccinated. It's then split into three main areas, whether there's been touch involved, um, if the social distance is less than 1.5 metres or it's greater than 1.5 metres. So as you can see on the screen there, um, if you look at it at uh, face value, you think, hell the hell, am I going to um, understand this table? But if you break it down into segments, it's, it's a bit easier to understand. And so the best outcome that you're going to get is there's four, four approaches here. One is you're either going to be have a co casual contact. The second one, you'd be a vaccinated close contact. The third one is a low risk casual contact. And the fourth one is an unvaccinated close contact. And if we move into the, the second table, which is about managing the risk for COVID, as again, there's the, the four approaches is here, you know, the quarantining requirements is testing, um, returning to work, what are, what are the requirements there? And then if particularly there's any area in the, in the household that requires quarantine requirements. But the way I see this is that from a, from a business point of view, the best outcome is to have low risk casual contact. contact. And, if, and what that means is that there's no requirement to avoid going to work. If there's casual contact, which is the next best level, means that that employee or employer has one day off work. We then move into what I call the, the vaccinated close contact, not a great outcome for businesses. It would mean that your employees will be off for work for, for seven days. And you can see the requirements there about when they have to be tested on a day over each period of time. And then the worst case scenario here is the unvaccinated close contact where you've got employees being off work for 14 days, which is not very palatable, particularly when you're a small business. Uh, so for me, it's about how do, we, how do we make sure that our employees are in a low risk casual contact or a casual contact. We want to avoid as much as we possibly can the orange and the red. The um, government department is also on SA Health have then just recently released a slide on the travel requirements, um, particularly people coming into the state. I uh, highly recommend that you look at this in once after this session is finished. But we have implemented the policy here at More Australia that anyone that's coming in from interstate or going into state, if they want to come back to work, they must, they must get a negative test. We won't allow them to come in if, if they don't get that test. All right. We strongly recommend um, you do a similar course. Safeguarding clients, customers and third parties, people coming in outside, they're not employees, but you need to make sure that they, you ask for a QR check-in. Um, again, require the face mask and, and keep your distance when meeting with them. Um, you, know, you go through that table, there's that 15 minute rule, making sure they don't stay longer than 15 minutes. Develop an open and honest conversation about COVID. Um, if, if you've got a relationship with the clients, customers, and the third party suppliers, if you're allowed to do that. And to book, book appointments. Uh, and send a test text message if that's applicable in your case. But where supplies are coming in for a short period of time, I think the important thing is that the face mask becomes mandatory. So what's in our control? And, and this is the important thing. None of what we're saying today is gonna to be bulletproof. We we know that we've we've had COVID since you know, March 2020. We know we're going to continue to live with it. We're seeing what's happening over in Europe and the US at the moment, the, the fourth waves. We're fortunate here in Australia that we are six months behind the rest of the world and we can learn from what's happening overseas as they head, as we head into winter in six months time. 
But we, what we're looking at is making sure that the business here, businesses here in SA don't have to shut down. And the reality is from, the, from what I'm hearing from the SA Health Department is they'll try to avoid that, but it all depends on how the health system is stacking up. Is it, is it coping with the amount of cases that they're getting? If it's not coping, then rest assured that businesses will be forced to shut down. So what can we do to minimise that is what we've been talking about this morning. So the things that we can control is making sure, as Grant's pointed out, we do a risk assessment of the workplace. So what, what are our levels of risk and how can we minimise them if we can at all? You should be surveying your employees on the vaccination status, knowing which ones are unvaccinated. I was talking to a pharmacist yesterday, his business. He said one of his pharmacists isn't going to vaccinate. Unfortunately, they can't come into work. So that puts more strain on him as an employer because it's not like there's many pharmacists out there that can come and work for him. So he's going to have to take on that, that role. And it'll, take, it'll put more strain on the employees. And that's something that we need to be, to be mindful of to make sure that they're, we minimise the level of anxiety that's happening in the workplace. This is not, um, you know, the ones that aren't vaccinated or the immune compromised, immunity compromised, we just need to have an open and honest conversation with them and how we're going to protect them. If it is possible, you've got the plexiglass protection. Um, that's, that's available. There's also uh, temperature checks, um, split shifts, which Grant has spoken about. Um, if you're in a professional office, we do have the flexibility of working from home. Um, if, and that means having all your employees take their laptops home from them each night and not forgetting them. Otherwise, if, we can't, if we're forced to lock down, then how can they work without their laptops? Make sanitizing stations and face masks readily available to everyone. And again, reminding and communicating to stay at home if you're unwell and don't come back to the workplace until you get a negative COVID test. Very common sense approach, but we need to, need to stick with these rules. Otherwise it'll get out of hand. And the last thing you wanna do is have your business shut down. I think in, in summary, we just have to be mindful of as of tomorrow, the state is opening up. We, we're all facing, we're very anxious about uh, as a business owner of where we're heading, but we just have to take day by day and just and, and have those plans in place in case the worst happens and to enable your business to stay open. As I said before, it's all about is the health system going to cope? If it copes, we'll be okay. If it doesn't, well, we just have to keep reinforcing the messages. How do we minimize our risk? So if you look at those tables that the SA Health has, has put out, to me, it's about one, how do we maintain low risk casual contact? And two, how do we maintain either casual contact? We don't wanna head into that, that third and fourth category, which means that they're off work for seven and 14 days. Like buying a piece of property, location, location, location. To me, COVID, the way I'm seeing it is about face mask, face mask, face mask. It's our best form of defense. The reality is, unfortunately, we all face the, the possibility that we're all going to get COVID one day. What, what it means to us is hopefully we, we extend the, that time frame for that to happen. On behalf of Grant and, and More Australia, we, we thank you for joining us today. We hope you got something out of the session. Uh, we look forward to for you to send your questions through to us um, and then we'll answer them uh, as soon as you can and we'll get back to you. But uh, Grant, have you got anything else to say? Just get off mute, Tim. Get my control panel uh, <laughs> control panel working. Yeah, look, I, I I agree entirely with what you know Tim Tim said. At, at the end of the day, you know what we're trying to achieve for our business, what we're trying to achieve for our clients' business is 
is is stopping those seven and 14 day lockdown periods. We know, as I'm sure everyone does, that if a business had to lock down for seven or 14 days, that, uh, you know, that, uh, that would be a, a, a terrible result for the client. So uh, if, you, if you take on board the, the business continuity risks that we discussed today, if you take on board the risk mitigation factors that, that Tim spoke about, um, you're putting yourself in the best possible chance to, to avoid that lockdown and that happening at, at SA Health. And if SA Health were to come in, you've got your documentation, you've got your policies, you show you've thought about it um, and you give yourself the best possible chance not to not to have to lock down. So, uh, no, and Green, entirely what Tim said. So, no, thank you, Tim. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. And we look forward to hopefully having a positive outcome when the port is open. If not, we'll be re-engaging with you all for another session on this topic. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.